Well, welcome to session six. Somebody say yay. yay. This, is, this is titled No Limits, A Lifestyle of Relentless Mind Renewal. And, and we're, we're, we're going to jump around a little bit in this, tie a few things uh, together that we said, add a few things concerning previous topics. And I wanted to start off by just going back a little bit with talking about worrying. We, last session, we discussed worrying with God. And there's a negative worry. There's some great quotes I've, I've heard about negative worry that, that I wanted to release. One, Corey Ten Boom said this, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Mark Twain said this, I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them have never happened. (laughs) That goes along with a study they did at the University of Cincinnati on worry. They found out that 85% of the things we worry about never happen. That's a lot of wasted time, huh? Max Lucado, he said this, how can a person deal with anxiety? You might do what one fellow did. He, he worried so much, he decided to hire someone to do his worrying for him. <laughs> he found a man who agreed to be his hired worrier for $200,000 per year. After the man accepted a job, his first question to his boss was, Where are you going to get the $200,000 per year? (laughs) To which the man responded, that's your worry. (laughs) Wendy's got a powerful testimony on, on just an encounter with God's love that I think would just be so, so good for this session. Yes, um, years ago, when we were still pastoring in the state of Nevada, we had gone to a Bethel conference, and in, back in those days, in the 90s, they were still doing the tape on the front, and everybody would come up and get prayed for, and I was just so hungry for God, and so wanted, you know, something, you know, God to change me, and This was before I had ever had any kind of encounter or vision or anything. This stuff was all new. And I'm up there just waiting on God, and I start having this vision. And in the vision, I'm standing by this lake on a grassy hill, and Jesus walks up, and we're able to communicate without speaking. We could just, you know, it wasn't even words being telepathically it was just we knew and so he walks up and I knew he wanted to dance with me and that was very difficult for me because I you know when I got saved I was an assembly of God girl and we didn't dance and especially with Jesus and (laughs) 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 but you know, we'd been under Bill's teaching for a few years, and he had said, you know, just lean into it, trust. And so I just kind of went with this vision. And so I'm waltzing with Jesus, and I know he wants me to look him in the eye. And something really amazing happened, because when I looked him in the eye, I could tell that he knew every single thing about me. He knew all of my weaknesses. He knew exactly who I was. But there was this unconditional love so shining out of his eyes, it just radically impacted me. It was like, I I can't believe this. You know, it, it was that thing of, a lot of times we think that God loves us collectively. And it wasn't, it was like the difference between, I love you all, but I'm in love with my husband. Yay. (laughs) <laughs> and that's what his eyes were saying it was saying I don't just love you I'm in love with you and then the vision ended and when it was done I started doubting it and thinking that was really weird you know I've finally just gone off the deep end and then 
you know, I've heard about things like this happening. <laughs> um, so I didn't tell anybody about the vision. I didn't even tell my husband. And we went back to Nevada, and the first Sunday we got there, a friend of mine sits down next to me and goes, Wendy, have you ever danced with Jesus? And my jaw kind of drops, and I'm like, yes, how did you know? And she goes, well, while you guys were gone, I was in the prayer room, and Jesus came and wanted to dance with me. And she was dancing, and she said, oh, Jesus, this is so cool, but nobody's ever going to believe I've danced with Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Wendy will, she has. <laughs> Somebody say, wow. Yeah. What kind of God do we serve? He didn't even condemn me for my doubt. He just wanted to make sure I knew that I knew that that had really happened. And then just to tag on to you know, the whole supernatural, what I discovered is that our encounters actually leave us with something imparted within us something of substance. And after that experience, I noticed two things. One, it was very hard not to love people. Huh. You know, it used to be, I love you because I'm a Christian and I have to love you. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually was coming out of a different source where it was hard not to love people. And the other was that it was something that I could transfer. And that happened because one sun Sunday, a, a teenager came in that didn't usually come to our church. And she came in and sat down in the back row. And have you ever seen somebody with no trespassing signs? It's like, I'm here, but nobody talk, leave me alone. I mean, it was all over her face. And I'm very sensitive to people's body language. And I'm sitting up in the front during worship, and God goes, go give her a hug. <laughs> and I'm like, you may not have noticed, but she has a no trespassing sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not into rejection. And so I tried to argue, and he wouldn't let me worship. It just was, go give her a hug. So I finally, I walk all the way to the in back of the room, and walk up, and I'm not even about to ask her if I can hug her, because it was like, <laughs> I know she would say no. So I just walk up, and I hug her. And when I do, the spirit of love just falls. And she begins to weep and cry, and she won't let go. You know, hugs are supposed to only last a certain amount of time. <laughs> 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 and when you go <clears throat> past that point, it's uncomfortable. So I'm like, okay. But at the same time, I'm feeling this presence of love. And I realize, wow, something is different in my life since I had that encounter of love with God. It was an actual substance. Have you ever sensed like hatred in a room or in a country or fear. I've been in earthquakes where it's so, such a bad earthquake that a spirit of fear actually overtakes the region. And people even say things like the, the fear was so thick you could cut it with a knife because they sense the substance of darkness. How come nobody ever talks about the substance of light? But love has a substance. Peace has a substance. Sometimes it's just emotions, but we can also bring a substance of love. And the other thing that happened is I used to feel like, you know, if I wanted to prove to somebody that I loved them, I thought I had to perform and do something for them so they would feel loved. Anybody feel that way, you know? And what happened was I would have people come up to me and go, I feel so loved by you. And I would think, I don't know why. I haven't done anything for you. <laughs> but it was something that was coming from me from that encounter. It's so powerful to be in his presence. 
That's such a great testimony on so many levels. We, we release over you dancing with Jesus experiences. Just how many of you know uh, times in prayer is more than just praying over a list? We don't devalue that, but it's something more. It's to encounter God. And what's so great about Wendy's experience is I know that I've watched the change that happened in her where she actually became a mom in the spirit because of a love encounter and able to give that away. And that's what moms and the spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers do. And even in this session and in those watching, the Lord is taking you to a higher level of being a mom and a father in the spirit. And it's linked to a love encounter. And Romans 5.5 5 says, hope does not disappoint. For the love of God has been poured out in your heart. Love encounters also are, create an undisappointable lifestyle. And, and we, we love all truths. We, every truth. We, we said earlier that the fruit of believing truth is having hope. The greatest truth of all truths is that God loves you. That's the greatest truth. And every other truth puts its roots into the soil of that truth, that God loves us. And if we can get that, and, and that, that changes everything. Just, just say, I, I am radically loved by God. I am radically loved by God. He not only loves me, but he's in love with me. <laughs> he not only loves me, but he's in love with me. I love testimonies. Just and I share with people, we have the opportunity to influence many leaders and in the revival movement and what God's doing right now. This whole movement is fueled by the power of the testimony. And how many of you know God's doing more than we think he's doing? Yeah. I have a theory that God is doing 7,000 times more than we think he's doing. Yep. And I have scripture to back it up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in 1 Kings 19, the prophet Elijah ended up in a cave. He, he, was, he was both in a physical cave and a spiritual cave. Have any of you here ever done cave time? <laughs> yeah, cave time. Now, the, the cave time, the, the symptoms of cave time is this, that what you feel is true is not true, even though it feels really, really true. <laughs> and so Elijah's in a cave. And I mean, because of tiredness, disappointment, and spiritual warfare, he ended up in a cave. And what he thought was true wasn't true. How many of you ever heard of the acronym HALT, H-A-L-T? Never make a major decision or major conclusion when you're hungry angry, lonely, or tired. Halt! <laughs> Steve, before you comment any further, please go to bed. <laughs> and I suggest you also eat something yes. and let go of a few things yeah. and get back into fellowship. Mm -hmm. and, and so Elijah's in a cave, and what he thought was true was not true. He said this, I'm the only one left. It's you and me, God. Aren't you glad you have me? If I don't know it's happening, it's not happening. How many you know prophets don't always get it right? Just because somebody's got named prophet after their name doesn't mean what they're saying is true. They may be prophesying out of their own disappointment out of their own frustration. And, and, and because of that, they, don't even, they can't see the bigger picture. And the Lord gave Elijah a perspective upgrade. He said, uh, Mr. Prophet Elijah, I've got news for you. I have 7,000 others who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. In other words, Elijah, there's 7,000 times more going on than you think is going on. Yeah. And I declare over you, there's 7,000 times more going on than you think is going on. You're not going to hear what's going on by watching the news. 
Matter of fact, if you watch the news too long, it'll put you in a cave. <laughs> oh, no, it's over. If you feed on that all the time, you'll get into a cave, and what you think is true is not true. But it feels so true. It's got to be true. Let's laugh that again. <laughs> the, these teachings are cave-extracting teachings. The, these teachings are, are pulling people out of caves, and, and it's also giving tools for us to extract other people out of caves. We're, we're in an hour where the Lord is healing up disappointed leaders, tired leaders, leaders who are, are in spiritual warfare. There, there, there's, there's something happening right now where people are getting touched with hope and vision. And it's coming from a truth encounter. It's coming from, wow, more's happening than I think is happening. And that makes me excited. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, one of the ways to get out of a cave is to actually start speaking our way out of the cave. I said that earlier, you know, just even in the beginning, the first session. We said there's two things. We, we love to have people do when we minister is we like to have people say things and we like to have people uh, laugh at things. And I, I, we wanted to come back just for a few minutes just, just on, on saying something and we're declaring. We, we talked about declarations, breaking off the arguments in our own mind. It, it's, when I wrote the book, uh, Declarations, 30 Biblical Reasons Why We Make Declarations, uh, how many of you know, by the way, just talking about some of those biblical reasons, how many of you know the worlds were created with a declaration? Right. Let there be light. Yes. The Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep, and then when God spoke, something happened. Jesus started his ministry in Luke 4 with a declaration. He, he, he said, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. David was making declarations going after Goliath. He was speaking. It's hard to be afraid when you're speaking. The centurion came to Jesus and said, my servant needs to be healed. And the centurion said, yeah, you know, Jesus, uh, you don't even need to go there. Just speak a word, he'll be healed. I understand how this thing works. Authority. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just make a declaration. And Jesus marveled. He said, wow, this guy knows how it works. <laughs> and and uh, I love, uh, in the book Declarations, I, I write um, answer six objections. One objection is, uh, aren't declarations just a repackaging of the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it heresy? <laughs> we answer that one. Uh, aren't declarations an attempt to override the sovereignty of God? We answered that. Aren't people who, who make declarations prone to be in denial about key things and action points that they actually need to make? We answered that. We answered the objection, I tried it and it felt fake to me. So the whole thing about words and, you know, we, the book, uh, when we were writing the book, You're Crazy If You Don't Talk to Yourself, that whole book and it was, was birthed out of my seeing uh, in, in Proverbs 18.21 that life is in the power of the tongue. And when I, when I first started saying that, w Wendy was a little uncomfortable with that. Let's just laugh at that, by the way. <laughs> um. When we started doing declarations and I put them on three by five cards and put them by my bed, and part of the reason I did that was because I had a real um, addiction to my emotions. And so unconsciously, every single morning, my first thought was, how do I feel today? Because that's how my day is going to be. Do I feel rushed? Do I feel overwhelmed? Do, you know... I was always asking myself, how do I feel? And um, it's really amazing how you will just come into agreement with those feelings. And you actually could have a bad day just because you came into agreement. 
And one day he said, you know, that's really the wrong question to ask in the morning. The real question every morning we should be asking is, what do I believe today? That's good. Something shifts when the first thing that we're concentrating on is, what do I believe today? I believe I'm powerful and mighty, that I can do all things through Christ, that I have more than enough energy, finances, anointing to do everything God called me to do today. What do you believe? Have that, because sometimes in the morning, I don't know about you, especially before I have my coffee, I'm so fuzzy. I don't know what I believe. Yep, let's laugh at that too. (laughs) And so in that void of not knowing what I believe, the enemy was really quick to tell me what I, you know, here's a suggestion what you could believe. It's probably Mm. going to be a bad day because you got this and this you have to do. So I had my declarations right by my bed so I could pull them up and I would say them out loud. And it just really, you know, compensated for that. And then the other thing about the declarations is when he was writing his book, You're Crazy If You Don't Talk to Yourself, he kind of mumbles scripture a lot when he's, you know, kind of meditating. And so he had shortened that scripture from (laughs) life and death is in the power of the tongue to just life is in the power of the tongue. And every time I heard him say it, something inside of me was like, oh, that doesn't feel right, you know? There's just something wrong. You know, it's like it's out of context or something. And finally... I heard Jesus say, do you know why it bothers you when he says life is in the power of the tongue? And I'm like, yeah, tell me so I can tell him. (laughs) 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 And he goes, no, the reason it bothers you when he says that is because you don't have a problem with having the power of death in your tongue, but you do religiously have a problem with life being in the power of the tongue. Mm. It was like it made me too powerful or something. There was just something there. And, and then he said, and I know you don't really believe that there's life in the power of the tongue because you don't speak. You know, it's a lot easier to speak death because you're just talking about what you've seen. And everybody's like, oh, yes, that's dead, that's dry. (laughs) Do you know how hard it is to speak life? Because everybody's like, no, there's no life there. To speak life, you actually have to go against the flow. And you actually have to say something different than what everybody else is saying. But there's so much power because God wants to join with us. He wants to co-labor. Both the enemy and God want your words. Hmm. Have you ever wondered why you feel so compelled to talk bad about a town? There was a town in Nevada that every time we drove through, it was all I could do to not say, oh, I hate this town. It's such a poverty-ridden town, or it has such a yucky spirit. I just felt compelled to speak negatively. And then one day I realized, oh, because he gets permission because I've given him the words. When we speak, we've released his permission to do that. We need to speak life. We don't, you know, just because it looks dead, don't keep killing it. (laughs) And what about yourself? Why? We need to start speaking life over ourselves. Instead of saying, I'm a failure, I'm ugly, I'm whatever, why don't you start speaking life? It's so powerful. Things really begin to shift when we submit our words to the Holy Spirit. It's not that we we never say anything that sounds negative. It's just the conclusions that we place. I'm more concerned about my conclusions that I I make. You know, like when it says, let the weak, in in Joel 3.10, let the weak say I am strong. It's not saying, uh, it's not about denial. It doesn't say, let the weak say I'm not weak. 
It's not about faith. It's not about denial. If you're battling weakness, go to the doctor, get prayer, remain authentic, to ask for help, but don't call yourself weak. Don't conclude you're who your experience says you are. That's, that's the key. Mm-hmm. It's not that you're never, you know, you're just so fearful. I'm in a, I'm in a straight jacket, can't say anything. <laughs> I mean, we all got to figure out how to work it out for ourselves. We got to figure it out because, you know, you can't put on Saul's armor. So you got to say, Holy Spirit, how do I speak life? Mm-hmm. And when we talk about relentless mind renewal, the, the key to relentless mind renewal is, is how you talk. It is how you talk. Romans, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Now, grace is the empowerment to do God's will. And I'm the greatest hearer of my own words. And so I get to impart grace to me. I get to determine how much grace I, I, I will receive. And so relentless. When, when we started getting these truths, it, it, it wasn't something where, I remember in Weaverville, we were pastoring there, and someone said, how long do I need to renew my mind? I say, you need to commit yourself to five years. You need to commit yourself to relentlessly renew your mind for five years. And, and because I believe it's not something you just try, well, you know, I'm going to try it for a week and then see what happens. No, it's a lifestyle, and it becomes part of, it's not the only thing you do. Renewing the mind is not the whole pie of the Christian life, but it's a piece. There's other things. This, this is, you know, we, we believe in intimacy we, you know, with the Lord. We believe in, you know, uh, accountability relationships. We, we believe in, you know, just being discipled, all of those things. But the renewing of the mind is one of the most important pieces that you can have within the pie of your, of your Christian life. Yeah, yeah and we're, we don't like it when people become word police. You know, you get so caught up in how powerful yeah. our words are that nobody can speak anymore in front of you. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to reiterate, it's not about talking about stuff that's going on. It, it's about making the final conclusion of this is who I am, or this is how it always is. You never do this. I never can do that. It's the identity statements that we try to get people to stay away from. And, you know, we even jokingly like to just say, you know, that if you're not, if you haven't had the experience of being organized, you just say, I'm an, an, orga- I'm an organized person having a disorganized experience today. Because the goal is that we want to change our identity so that eventually who we really are starts coming out. And if you think about it, the God who organized the universe lives within you. How disorganized can you be? (laughs) 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 We just have to start pulling on, you know, because we're not trying to become something we're not. We're trying to find out who we are and start pulling it out of us, and this is the real me, and and recognizing that the past was just my experience, because we tend to come, we we tend to make our identity from that instead of what God has said. So that's really huge. It changed my life when I started coming into agreement with God about who I was. You know, and even when you're sick, I used to say things like, you know, my cold or whatever. And now if I want prayer, I'll just say, I'm fighting a cold. I didn't catch one. I'm fighting it, you know. And that may seem small, and you can take that as far as you want. But, you know, the scripture came alive. I can't remember now where it's found, but where it says that you'll be held accountable for every idle word. Matthew 12, yeah. That used to kind of bother me because it was like, oh my goodness, what, you know, I did tell an off colored joke once and um, <laughs> I'm going to be held accountable that. And then Steve was meditating on that one day and he said, you know, I think what that really means is that we become accountable because what we spoke actually came to pass. You actually have the consequences of what you're speaking. 
And when you get to heaven, you're going to realize, wow, that's on account of what I said. Speak something different. Don't, you know, I, I always get kind of frustrated when people say, but yeah, I just want you to validate my feelings. And because I came out of being addicted to emotions, I looked up that word validate, and it means to, to actually give it substance and authority. Do you really want me to come into agreement with your feelings? That's one of the things that we say to each other. We haven't lately, but when we first started on this, one of us would say something like, you know, it, I don't know if I can do this. I'm really tired. And he'll say something like, do you want me to come into agreement with that? <laughs> no. <laughs> so two stories here to end. One is, let me ask you a question. If an apple tree is too young to have apples on it, is it still accurate for the apple tree to say he has the gift of apples? <laughs> yes. Let's say this is an apple tree that's too young to have apples, and this apple tree can talk and says, because I do not currently have apples on me, I do not have the gift of apples. <laughs> Many Christians would applaud, oh, yes, amen. That's a good word, Brother Apple Tree. <laughs> because if you had the gift of apples, apples would currently be on you. And because apples aren't currently on you, it proves you do not have the gift of apples. Let's laugh at that. <laughs> if I heard the apple tree say that, I'd say, uh, uh, listen, Mr. Apple Tree, it's in your very DNA to have apples. They're coming. You don't need to have apples hanging on you to say you have the gift of apples. They're coming unless you keep talking like that and build a stronghold that blocks who you really are. Mr. Apple Tree, I want you to repeat after me. <laughs> I am an apple tree having a non-apple tree experience. <laughs> I don't need the fruit of something hanging on me to say I got it. I don't need the fruit of great leadership hanging on me to say I'm a great leader. I don't need the fruit of great husbandhood to be on me to say I'm a great husband. And so it's just, it's just, that's helpful to just, we're not lying to call ourselves who we are before we are. Yeah. Can I share a testimony concerning that? In the 90s, we went to Toronto, you know, when the whole laughter thing broke out. And in one of the breakout sessions for intercessors that I was in, uh, Carol Arnott had shared that in a vision, she had received this huge giant sword for intercession, and she asked everybody called to intercession to come up and receive this, that she was supposed to pass it on. And there was about 50 of us in a circle, and she was in the middle, and she went around, and she would take our hands, and, you know, in the name of Jesus, I impart this sword. And it was just, you know, an imaginary, you had to use faith that she was actually giving you something. But she's going around the room, and all of these people, every time she gives it to them, they're having these manifestations. I mean, some of them are like they can't pick it up, and they're struggling, and others are doing warfare, and all kinds of weird manifestations. And she came to me, and nothing happened. And so my first thought, you know, usually when nothing happens, our first thing is, what's wrong with me? You know, maybe I'm not an intercessor. Or I'm not good enough yet to have the sword. You know, there's something uniquely wrong with me. And so <laughs> I, you know, we got back home to Nevada where we were pastoring. And I obviously didn't share this testimony. But I was leading an intercessors group, and we had a... a cowboy who had just gotten saved. He had no background, didn't know anything about Toronto, didn't know anything about manifestations. I mean, he was just, you know, kind of an alcoholic that got saved and, you know, but he was very prophetic. So he came to our intercessors group and we're praying for him. And I hear the Holy Spirit go, give him the sword that you got in Toronto. And I'm like, oh, don't you remember I didn't get one? <laughs> 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 
So, you know, I'm kind of having this inner battle about, how do I give this to him? I was the only one who didn't receive one. And he said, just give him the sword you received. And so finally, I just grab his hands and I just say, in the name of Jesus, I just give you this sword of intercession that I received in Toronto. And he immediately starts manifesting exactly like everybody in Toronto was doing. Wow. And then a little bit later, a prophetic guy came into our church, and he was prophesying over me, and he goes, yes, you, you're like typhoid Mary. And I'm like, thanks. I, you know. <laughs> and I think he saw the look on my face. It was like, I thought prophecy was supposed to be good. And he goes, no, no, it's good. Typhoid Mary was a carrier of the disease, but she had no symptoms. And when he said that, I realized how many of us in the body of Christ were sitting in our pew waiting for the symptoms when we should just be giving it away. You don't have to have symptoms, you could just be a carrier. It has set wow. me free. Don't wait until you feel like you're carrying something. I didn't know I had the sword until he told me to give it away. You've received some things in conferences, in church meetings, impartations, that at the moment you may have even felt like this emotional thing, but then you went home and nothing was happening. Maybe you just need to try to give it away. Just say this, I am carrying more than I know. I am carrying more than I know. <laughs> All right, here's, here's, we're going to wrap it up with this. Now, <clears throat> when he's talking about back in the 90s, go to Toronto, go to places like Reading, other places, they frequently moved the chairs, they had tape on the floor, and so you'd line up maybe 40 people across uh, on the tape, and you'd wait for the prayer servant to come and pray for you, you know. And so they'd pray with you a minute or two, and they'd have someone behind you called a catcher. And so I remember standing in line, you know, waiting for the prayer servant to come towards me. I'd see this person here get blown backwards four feet. This person here get electrified under the power. This person here fall out like a dead person, out this person here would shriek. This person here would run around the building, <laughs> come to me, nothing would happen. And, and then it was like machine gun fire. <laughs> now, I know I wasn't the only one standing, but it felt like it. And while I was standing there, the devil would encourage me. He would, say, he would say this. He would say, Steve, there is something wrong with you. So I'd be standing there renewing my mind with that. <laughs> that there's something wrong with me. And he would say this. He'd also say, you're never going to have encounters because there's something wrong with you. I'd be meditating on that as well. <laughs> And so the Holy Spirit said, Steve, do you want help with that? I said, yes, I want help. He said, first of all, of course there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with everybody. That's why I sent Jesus, get over it. <laughs> Tur turn to your neighbor and say, get over it. The, the second thing he said, he said, you don't receive by feeling, you receive by faith. Amen. What do feelings have to do with it anyway? So I want you to believe it's impossible to get prayed for and nothing happened. I want you to believe you're an encounter machine having a non-encounter experience. <laughs> so I say, here's the attitude I want you to have in such things as prayer lines. So prayer servant working his way towards me. <laughs> woo <-hoo! laughs> the, the, the prayer servant, he's coming. <laughs> he, he's, 
He's coming. He, he's almost here. <laughs> <laughs> Abounding in hope. And the same thing, blown backwards, electrified, out under the power, shriek, run around the building, come to me, nothing outward happens, machine gun fire. <laughs> Someone could come up to me and say, uh, Steve, um, <clears throat> what happened? I don't know. Did you feel anything? No. Then why are you so happy? <laughs> well, I'm so happy because something bigger is happening here in my life than me having an encounter. Yeah. I'm demolishing an argument. Yeah. I'm demolishing an argument. I'm demolishing the argument that my past experience determines who I am and what I'm going to experience in the future. I'm going after it, and I'm excited, woohoo! Because I just got prayed for. <laughs> and it's impossible to get prayed for and nothing to happen. And by the way, I'm an encounter machine. <laughs> well, where's your encounter? It's coming. But because our, our experience always catches up to our beliefs. Whew. And the gap time is called faith. It's called faith. And, you know, whoo, I'm an encounter machine. Whoo. One drop of the Holy Spirit falls in the room. It falls on me. I, I encounter angels. I have trances all the time. <laughs> I go out under the power, and then boom, you catch that, well, you know, I'm just, it finally caught up, so, whoa, what's happening here? Oh, I'm glad this thing's here. I think I might need a designated driver. Here, here, here in church. I guess so, I, I want to tag on to that, because in the 80s, we were taught so much about the power of witches. And I can remember God saying, you know, even though when you heard that maybe a witch had cursed you, you didn't have to have any feelings to have expectation. You had just been told so often that something bad's going to happen. You know, so if you picture you're in a prayer line and a powerful known witch comes up and prays over you, the question is, do you have the same expectation from a witch's prayer as a Christian's? Mm. I didn't feel anything, so the Christian prayer didn't do anything. But the witch, I didn't feel anything, but I'm worried. Just laugh at that. And so, you know, I want to get to that place where I have more expectation from a Christian's prayer than a witch's. So we release over you something bigger is happening in your life, even than having an encounter. Something bigger is happening in your life of even getting everything we're saying. God today is demolishing that argument of past experience. The Lord today is, is renewing your mind. Transformation is coming. It's coming in a powerful way. And, and we just, uh, it's just been such an honor to, to speak to you today. And, you know, some of the things that we do, I mean, we have a, a negativity fast every Lent, Lent season that we do. Anybody do that who's here? A number of you. We're going to do it again. We use our book, Igniting Faith in 40 Days. We'll probably use this uh, DVD curriculum as as a part of that, we're doing a pastor's conference uh, this year in Denver, Colorado. You can find that out on our website. And we, we just love to give people tools, to just practical tools to have inner victory, personal victory, and then see corporate victory. So what a joy it has been to be with you. If you receive the word, say, I receive it. I receive it. I'll never be the same again. These teachings, have changed my life. These teachings have changed my life. 
It's been a turning point in my life. It's been a turning point in my life. And I'll never be the same again. And I'll never be the same again. Amen. Give God thanks and praise. Yeah.